we are coming to you from Guide Collective. Um, I am in theory in Siena, but I'm not. I'm really in San Diego. Roberto, where are you right now? I am in my home, my office in, uh, in a channel, which is in the Clay Hills, just uh, 20 minutes from Siena, south of Siena. And Brian, where are you? Right now I'm in Long Beach, California. So again, I'm Trish Beaster. I'm the host of this, and I'm here with Brian and Roberto. And they are going to be talking to you about Tuscany Beyond Expectations. And this is a documentary that they have created over the last few years. It is now available on Amazon. And we, as Guide Collective, we get a sneak peek. And we wanted to share this with all of you guys. Um, and so I just wanted to go over, Brian, you are of Italian descent, are you not? Right. My dad's father, my grandfather, was born in northern Italy, just outside of Milan. And how um, much did you know about your Italian heritage before going to Italy? People in my family had made attempts to try to connect with our family. And after my father passed away, my mom was of the impression that there's nobody there in this small town called Turbigo. Turns out that I went onto Facebook and uh, typed in, does anyone know my grandfather and posted a photo. And within 15, 20 minutes, I'm your cousin, I'm your cousin. We all still live here. Your, um, the, the home where your father was born, we still have, um, you know, come see us, come visit us. It was uh, just, I don't know, goosebump moment, you know, not expecting to get any response. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. And you had told me before that you actually, well, you've traveled quite a bit. It's not that you hadn't right, reached out right. to your, you know, you hadn't had that experience reaching out to your family, but you actually did a study abroad in France. Is that right? Right. When I was 16, I living in St. Louis, Missouri, I convinced my mom and dad that I need to go to Paris for the summer and live with a French family and learn French. And you can only imagine what they were thinking, you know, but I somehow, my passion convinced them and I became fluent in French by the time I was, you know, 16, 17. That's amazing. Yeah, because you're like now, a sponge, you're like a sponge back then. You know, it's so easy, it's a lot harder. I'm trying to learn Italian now. I'm doing fairly well, but not, not like it was when I was 16. I would venture to say that when most people think of Tuscany, they think of scenes like this, the rolling hills of Tuscany, uh, beautiful vineyards. They think probably about the olive oil of which Roberto is a producer. He, he has a farm where he makes his own olive oil. Of course, they think about the wine and maybe they think about the foods. Um, but you have an interesting title, Tuscany Beyond Expectations. Can, can either or both of you talk to us about why you picked that title? It goes back to when I met, uh, actually, um, through uh, Facebook, uh, Brian. Brian uh, was just posting some uh, pictures of Tuscany, beautiful pictures he took, you know, really beautiful. And I was touched that he had that sensibility of showing my, my land and all. And I, you know, and I follow his comments and everything. And I just didn't you know, send him a message saying, you collected such a beautiful image uh, of my land, but uh, you are missing the most important thing, which is meeting the people. And uh, he, uh, you know, sent me back a message saying, okay, and what should I do? And I said, just come here and just see my land, uh, you know, through, my eyes, I guess. He was, and uh, I, I, I would I have be happy to, to I, show you. I have to interrupt because Go ahead. he was a lot more mysterious. Okay, I did not know him at okay. all. This was just on an open social sure. media page. It wasn't like we were friends or had any mutual no, no, friends no, of course. common, no one. And he says, um, would you like to see Tuscany through my eyes? That was the first thing. Like, who is this guy? What does he want? What is he selling? Who me? is this crazy man reaching out right, to me? Right, right. I was, I, well, I was just in Tuscany. It may be different if I hadn't been there. I just got back from 
taking Italian lessons in Montepulciano. So I was like, who is this guy? And then I started asking him questions and um, things like, uh, well, if I did come, what would I see? And he would say, no, no agenda, no expectations. People, okay. meet people. I'm like, what are you talking about? I, I just wasn't getting it. And then I said, well, then when, we, when I decided to come, I said, what should I pack? And he said, an empty suitcase so that you can bring back lots of memories. And then there was just something that so either this guy's a writer or something. I don't know what he is, but he's very profound. I have to get to know this man. And that was the first instinct in my gut that I should do it. It was just because he was a little off of center and how he was talking to me. And that made me curious. And, and I think Roberto has, has a way with that. You know, I've kind of, from a distance, Roberto and I have known each other for years and we never actually even got to meet in person until a, a few years ago. And I was so charmed by him and everything that everybody had ever told me about him was so spot on and so true that there is a wisdom that comes from him. There is a passion about not only Siena, but for Tuscany in general and for his, his people, for the Italian people that he imparts in such a way that you get swept up in that. And I can imagine how you must've felt when he reached out to you that way and, and had you hooked, you know? Yeah, he did. And we, well, didn't talk, we, didn't, we didn't talk about making a film. That wasn't, I just said, well, if I'm going to see something so unique, I guess I need to get a camera. And I went out and I actually read the instructions for the, how to operate the camera on the plane. It didn't, you know, it was just, just trust the wind and go and do it really is what it was. You got to go with your gut sometimes. Yeah. So just so everybody has kind of an understanding of this, um, you know, we have travelers who, who follow Guide Collective that may have had very extensive travel. And some of you might have just focused on other areas. So talking about Italy, you can see we have about 20 different um, regions. And here is Tuscany, huge region that extends not only from kind of central and just a little bit east in, in Italy, but then goes all the way to the coast. So you've got quite a diverse land to cover. And um, you show us some pretty amazing images. I do wanna share this with everybody. We're gonna take a look at just a short clip of the opener of Tuscany Beyond Expectations. Okay, well, I hope everybody was able to hear that because not only did we have these gorgeous images of Tuscany, we had that delightful music playing in the background as the soundtrack uh, to this opening montage. And can, if you guys wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about David Friedman, who was the composer that you guys enlisted for your documentary. I was very pleased. David has been a friend of mine for many, many decades. We go way, way back to New York. And I knew that he wrote spiritual uplifting music. He's a famous composer, he's written for Diana Ross, Barry Manilow, 
But not only that, he's a conductor, uh, vocal arranger for the Disney feature films, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Pocahontas. And uh, we were actually in Palm Springs, uh, sitting at a table outside before, way before COVID, saying that I was telling him about the film. And he says, I'll do the music. Didn't ask him. He said, I'll do the music. I said, he just volunteered. When I told him what it was about and that I wanted to do something about trust and uh, not waiting in life to do things and the messages, he was all for it because he's an author as well. He's written a lot of uh, books like the Thought Exchange, self-help books and things like that. So he's communicating for a better world through his music. So he was on board. And, well, and I, I think that you can feel that in the music because it, it matches so well, of course, to the imagery that you have, but there is something uplifting and joyful and poignant. And there, there's a kind of a sense of reverie and memory, but also aspiration that happens through there, which is a very challenging thing to do for a musician to write all of those emotions into there, especially when you're just doing it uh, basically keyboard and not full instrumentation. So I'm quite impressed by what yeah, he is he, able to do for you guys. Yeah, David always says that he doesn't write music. Uh, the music just comes through him mm -hmm. and that's how it, it happens, you know? So I think he's a genius. Actually, if I can, if I can say something, um, about that um, music, any art, any art, even the art of filming something or catching something, it's it's uh, sometimes needs uh, to have an instinct. In our case, in our case, we didn't have a script, so everything was very instinctive. We had to film much, much, much more than any other filmmaker would do with a script. With a script, you are following, you know, a road. We were just experiencing all these people that you see in this video uh, without preparing them to the film. You know what I mean? We were just shooting uh, their life and their emotions, everything, without the script. And so I think that the, the musician, David, uh, felt that, felt that this was a genuine, uh, you know, filming. And uh, he, uh, you know, like a tailor plays uh, amazing music on, on it. Well, and, and that's the thing, you picked the right word, genuine, because I feel that sense of authenticity. When I watch this, um, it's raw moments, right? Like it's not, you can't make somebody uh, you know, say these certain things or whatever. They were moments that were revealing themselves, opening themselves up like layers of onions as you peel them back. And then you get deeper into the heart of that and you, and you feel that connection, which I'm, I am so excited for people to be able to watch this because if anybody has previous connection to Italy or Tuscany because of their travels, or if you have any aspirations to travel there, I think that this really draws you in because you've made that human connection. And I wanted to share a couple of things. So one of the, we have a few clips that we're gonna share with you guys today. And the first one happens in Montepulciano and look at this amazing landscape here in this hill town. And just so that you have a sense of where things are, Montepulciano is about uh, one and a half uh, hours southeast of Florence. And they, the, the, the gentlemen, Brian and Roberto, take us to an event called Bravillo. And let's just watch it first and then we'll find out a little bit more from both Brian and Roberto. Those wine barrels weigh over 175 pounds each. The steep uphill race through cobblestone streets to the main square is called Bravia. Roberto, the passion of the townspeople cheering for their district to win was so moving. I didn't want anyone to lose. Brian, the irony is that nobody really lost. There was a winner, but think about it. Before the race, we saw people proudly parading their medieval customs, showing us a sense of belonging and unity. 
The winner's prize is not money. It's honor. This is the reason why I brought you here, to understand the real spirit of a community before you meet the actual people. That was a really cool <laughs> clip. Um, and Roberto, as our tour guide, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little bit of history of Bravillo and why you decided to show this to Brian. Well, this is a, a, a not as famous as the horse race in Siena the, 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 called the Palio, which is done with the horses. But in, in the old times, in, in, in the medieval periods, many, 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 many medieval village had uh, competitions between the districts, which are tiny, small community inside the city, inside the city wall. And uh, obviously, uh, Montepulciano uh, is very is steep. <laughs> it's, it's really... Uh, on top of a sharp hill. And when the, uh, the, the roads were not anymore made of dirt, but they paved it, they couldn't uh, compete anymore with the horses. So they started to compete with barrels because as you know, in Montepulciano, they make uh, the famous Nobile di Montepulciano wine. And so that's what they're doing now. But the, the, the reason why I took him there is because I want to, him to feel the community, the feeling of the community, the pride, the, the joy uh, of the people of belonging to a community. This is very important because <clears throat> when you study geography in, in the United States, I'm sure like in Italy, they say that the world is divided in five continents, but it's a lie geographically. Europe is not a continent. It's only a continent because of, of its history or because of his past. That's why we call them a continent. And so <clears throat> these um, people that uh, have been living in this medieval village for centuries and centuries, they have this uh, beautiful thread uh, in a way that they, they still weave with the future generations. And I wanted him to feel that first before we actually met the locals, before we share our life with them because it was very important that also these people will meet Brian so that we will have this uh, cultural, you know, exchange and, and worked perfectly. It was just beautiful. And, and I so was, sorry, go ahead, Brian. Thanks to Roberto and his connections in Montepulciano, I was able to stand in the street. If you look at that shot, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not behind the ropes. I felt very honored, I guess is what I'm saying that I, that Roberto was able to get me a press pass to do that. Well, and to be that up close and personal, not only with the, the competition itself, but I'm sure you must have seen a lot of the parade and pageantry and all of the other events associated with it. I, I wanna know your takeaways from that, Brian. You have to realize I shot this by myself with no crew. So I'm shooting, I knew I wanted to get the start of the race, but the end of the race is at the very top of the hill. How do I get there? I was running with my camera under my arm and my tripod. You know, that's why I, I don't have the footage of them going across the line. I only have the footage of seeing the winner. So again, um, but when I saw the pageantry, it was just so reverent and beautiful and everybody coming together to celebrate how proud they were they are to wear their colors. And, and knowing that there's gonna be a big party afterwards, it really wasn't about the winner. It was about the honor of the event and the history. And, and I'm sure Roberto could speak to that even more, but the feeling was just, I felt like I was, had gone back to the middle ages. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. They were blowing trumpets out, out of windows, um, fanfares drums. Well, and I love that notion that, you know, with the eight contrade, with the di eight different districts, yes, it is a competition and everybody's rooting for their own home team, but the celebration is for everybody. It's that communal spirit. It's that we are sharing in this together and we're bound by things that are deeper and longer and greater than, than whatever a neighborhood rivalry might be. You know, we're, we're one community even if there are eight different parts, which I think is a really 
really cool thing. Mm -hmm. um, let's go to another place in Tuscany. Many of you might know Florence, and that's where we end up meeting in this in this documentary. Uh, somebody very important to Roberto, and um, if if you're not familiar with where Florence is, it's about three hours northwest of Rome, and about um, one and a half hours north of Siena. And let's just watch this little clip here. We're going to meet Romano, a dear friend of Roberto. We have not to forget, first of all, that Florence was a dis descending from Fiesole, which was a Etruscan center. And the Etruscan civilization is one of the best in all Tuscan history because she and he were on the same level, and a harmony between woman and man. And that's, it's what we should find and discover also for the future. So Roma, we've got Romano, and Roberto, if you wouldn't mind, please, if you would share a little bit about your connection to Romano and why you chose to share him with Brian, and then Brian, why you chose to share him with all of us. Well, um, the first thing the, the people need to know is that he died yesterday. So it's a little bit hard for me, but to talk about him because he's been my, my life mentor. A man that uh, after a few seconds you met him, uh, you know that he is able to touch your soul. Uh, you know that when you leave him, you are richer. You know that uh, every word uh, he shared with you is a piece of wisdom. One of these Renaissance men that you meet in your life, and even if they touch you softly, they are able you know, to switch your life in a different direction. That's what uh, Romano was for me. So. I thought that uh, sharing this uh, person with uh, Brian uh, it would give him a, a deep, a very deep sense of uh, uh, what it means to be Toscan, in this case, uh, Florentine. Um, and uh, 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 Brian uh, was very touched about that, I know that. Yes, I... Um... Again, I met Romano not knowing what to expect. That's the whole concept is Roberto would never say, this is what you're going to get. You know, I just was my camera and the man spoke from his heart about what he felt was important. And again, you have to remember when I shot the footage, we did not know there was going to be a documentary. I was just recording my trip. I thought maybe, it would go on YouTube or Facebook, but never thought of making a documentary. And when I got home and I started looking at the footage, I said to Roberto, I think he could be the glue for the whole, for like a documentary where we would get his wisdom and then cut away and open it out of the shop. But everything he talks about somehow in a not, um, in an organic way, try to show what he's talking about. And that became one of about 32 versions of this, <laughs> this film that finally came to what people can see now on Amazon Prime. But um, it worked perfectly. I mean, I think it worked really well. I, he, I would agree with you. I, I The way that you have shot it and the way that you have edited it all together, and, and by the way, Brian did all of that. So he, not only was he producer, he was director, he was the cameraman, he was the editor for all of this. And with some, I think with some editing help from Roberto, but, but the bulk of you know, the technological aspects I think came from Brian. And the way that you've woven that together to give us kind of these pearls of wisdom that come from Romano, that come from not only his mind and his heart, but his soul. And then giving us these kind of visual tangible examples of what he's talking about that's it is a beautiful through line I think it's kind of a work of genius that you guys found a way to do that and uh, it makes it that much more real more authentic right. as, as 
as Brian was saying, or I like the word organic, it, 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 we didn't have to fatigue at all in trying to match what uh, Romano was telling us and what we saw earlier and later after him. It, it was just uh, amazing to us still, um, when I look at it again, and I've seen this many times, you can imagine, uh, every, every single time I think that uh, there is a spiritual driven force in, 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 in what we did it. So I, I, at least talking about myself, I, I don't take any credit because I was just uh, in the river and I just followed the current. Everything was, was you know, fluid, floating and, and, and running well. And but I don't know if Brian felt the same. That's how it, I felt. Roberto, if you hadn't introduced me to your mentor, um, I don't think the documentary would have happened. Because what we would have had was a lot of footage of a lot of other people, but no way to tie it together. Um, it surely wouldn't have happened as in this version anyway. So, nice. so yeah, it, it did come together because you felt compelled to show me your mentor, which is just another layer of the, of the whole process, that, that peeling away of the onion, like you were saying, Trish. It's, it's, I'm just so happy to have had the, the honor to now have him on film for many future generations to see. Um, we're, we're already getting messages from people who have seen the film saying that they're much better just from know, knowing him in the few short minutes that he appears in the film. That they are now in, in their, he is now in their consciousness, which is pretty amazing. That is a beautiful thing. Um, and I, I'm, I'm getting a little bit emotional. <laughs> um, let's let's kind of let's talk about a couple of other things that he shared with us in this in particular in this clip he was talking about the etruscans and roberto again as our tour guide for the day if you could just give a little bit of insight into what he was talking about in terms of the equality between men and women in that culture and other insights that you might want to share sure the um the etruscans are obviously uh, our very first uh, ancestor in history, not in prehistory, but uh, they had the written language and they had the, <clears throat> obviously a very sophisticated culture. And meanwhile, everybody is studying the Roman and the Greek uh, civilization, which were amazing, don't get me wrong. The Etruscans had this uh, equality between male and female, this balance, this harmony, as uh, was uh, well expressed by uh, Romano. And so my, my passion and hobby is studying and learning about the Etruscans. Because being our ancestor, they, they set up the clock for whatever we did in Tuscany after them. And there is one scene where we show a mother holding her baby in a lap in, 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 with the symbolism that a woman doesn't need a man uh, to recognize his child. In Roman and Greek time, instead it was uh, being a very patriarchal society, it was the man that gave the name uh, to the child and could be recognized by the father. In Etruscan time, no. So I, I got fascinated about how much art the Etruscans were able, as you see, to create. Even if a little tool, simple, not maybe belonging to the aristocrats, had the sense of beauty. And is, is it actually the perfect balance that you have inside of you or you have in your society, male and female, that can create the beautiful art that you are seeing, you're showing us over here. So I uh, feel very proud that the Etruscans are my ancestors. But if, if you uh, look at the big picture, uh, the Etruscans are the ancestor of all of us, not just of the Etruscans. Uh, in a way, because they influence our culture, which uh, uh, our culture influence others. So um, we should look at the history in that in their way, you know. And that's why I brought uh, Brian to the museum. I want to introduce him to who gave us the the the, the very first uh, work. Uh, talking about textile. 
Well, I think that um, having that connection and having us have that understanding that a civilization, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to say uh, a lot of other people might say primitive cultures or th use terminology like that, but there's nothing primitive about this other than the relation to the word prime and being first, right? Um, but this, this notion that this incredible civilization has had influence on so many other generations that followed them and the sadness that we have lost some of what they had right I mean there is no they, they might have had a written language but we don't necessarily have everything transcribed or access to all of that information and and the beautiful artifacts and things that we do find that we're preserving and keeping in these museums cherishing our history it's it's so important to understand that things are not always how they have been that there are other ways, that there are smart ways to do things, there are beautiful ways to do things, there are creative and inventive ways to do things. And that, that continuum of ingenuity and progress and cooperativeness is something that can and does link us all together, regardless of what time period we're in. Um, and I wanna take us a little bit farther forward and talking about traditions, Etruscan traditions and belief systems. I want to go a little bit farther forward into a delightful little clip that you shared with us, Brian. And it's with the, um, remind me of their name again, which family is this? The Conforti family. Conforti family, thank you so much. And they have a, a farm where they uh, grow a lot of grapes and they produce their own wines and they um, have other amazing crops that they have there, but they're going to show us a little bit of a Tuscan tradition and just the notion of treating yourself well to good things. Ciao, Brian. Oui. Non le prendo da qui. Canto uccino nel bicchiere del vinsantino. Poi morzino. Mm. <laughs> so just in that little clip, oh, um, we learn about cantucci, or cantuccini, little cookies, and the vin santo. And Brian, had you ever had that before coming on this trip to Tuscany? I had it the, the very first time I went to Tuscany, and I had been there once, and then I came back. So yeah, I, I had it the first time, but... Um, it was just so different to have it in a family setting as opposed to in a restaurant by yourself or with you know a friend to, to be with the family. And the mother, it, she has her covering her face like that because she's so embarrassed what he's doing on camera. You know, It was just a great moment. And actually I caught that with my cell phone. That was cell phone footage. Oh, is that right? Oh my yeah, gosh. I, was, I wasn't even expecting um, to be recording at that time, I had just arrived and uh, they had prepared lunch for me. That was lunch. And we were going to shoot after the sun went down a little bit because it was too bright. So I had the camera away, it was charging. And all of a sudden I saw him do this and I <laughs> whipped out my cell phone. So I'm glad I got that moment. It's a very, it's a nice moment. It is a delightful moment. And um, I, I don't know those of you who are watching if you've ever had the opportunity to have this because when you see it in the United States that you know you, they sell it as boxes or or packages of biscotti twice cooked cookie and um, here we call it cantucci and then when you dip it into that bean santo it's amazing how the flavor changes Roberto can you talk to us a little bit about why that combination and why that has become a tradition and why that's so important to, to share and feature here in this documentary. Well, you know, uh, in, in the filming, it's very clear what Vinsanto is because we, we have another scene where we show uh, how Vinsanto is made, but it's a dessert wine and today it's available to everybody. And so the cookies are uh, available to everybody and you can buy it to a reasonable price. It's not uh, a treat, as we say. It's nice, but it's not a special treat. But in the old times, the Vinsanto, which it takes uh, five years to make it because it's a, a very complicated process of uh, making the wine uh, oxidize and uh, uh, reduce the water content uh, and getting most, most of the sugars inside. 
And so it's a dessert wine. Uh, uh, it takes uh, so long to, to prepare it, to make it, that you just gave it to uh, people that uh, were guests in your home or uh, for special occasions, anyway. And so the cookies, because uh, they have uh, a long preparation, you have to cook them twice. It takes uh, time. And so what is today that uh, we appreciate the most when somebody gives us a gift? It's a gift that is made by hand by him. Somebody to spend his time, you know, in order to give you something. It's love, no? It's love, that's what it is. Giving some time for other people. And, and it, both of them, the cookies and the Vincenzo take a long time to make them. So when somebody gives you that, it's a special occasion. And uh, I am very happy that Brian got to taste uh, uh, these, but also I'm very happy that I was not there because I, I, I was sometimes I was afraid I, I was a uh, filtering, you no, know, if I was there present. And instead, the, Brian had the plenty of time to introduce him, but I saw any shots like this that you just show us were natural, and I couldn't ask for better. I mean, <laughs> you, you cannot do a script with that. <laughs> no, you can't. You show us in the documentary kind of some behind the scenes of what they're doing on the farm and how they're producing their wine. And you can tell from this family, it's the father and it's the three sons who have been working together. There is love and passion behind it. And to know where your product comes from, to connect with the actual human being who has made this thing, I'm sure just takes the the dining experience that communal shared experience to a whole other level for you this family is like i feel like they're my family now we have been in touch we're on facebook we're sending messages it's just amazing and they're the sweetest nicest men and it has to start at the top because they're all like that and and look at the joy in their faces i mean mm -hmm. but how many generations is this, Roberto? Seven. Seven. Seven, seven wow. generations. Seven generations. Running this family vineyard. That's amazing. Winery. Yeah. Well, there is another common denominator in our video. Is the relationship between fathers and son. Some of these things are personal, like Brian had a personal experience you know, with his father. The, and also I have uh, my mentor, that is like a spiritual father from, and uh, you just keep seeing, you just keep seeing these, uh, you know, generations uh, meeting and understanding each other, and, and that's that's beautiful when it happens. And and you may or may not have caught it because we we try not to hit anybody over the head with the lessons. We kind of want to either you get the lessons from the film or you don't. Some people will view this as a travel piece and other people will see some of the messages that we were trying to convey. If you remember Romano in the shop is holding up a logo of his business. And it's a picture of a father showing his kids, making sure the kids are showing the fabric in the right way to the customers. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's true. And, the, and then if you notice, we go to the farm and we see the father pulling the leaves, showing his three sons how to do it. And it's that idea of keeping the tradition, doing it correctly, keeping the tradition alive. And they all look so. like movie, and they all look like movie stars, which makes it nice for a filmmaker. Okay, I'm so glad that you said that, and I wasn't the one who brought it up. But they, none of them are hard on the eyes. Let's just all admit that right now. <laughs> I, I said. Roberto, these are movie stars. Where are you taking me? What, what is this? <laughs> I, 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 I shot to my foot. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take a minute right now just to acknowledge that some of the people who are watching us right now and who have been commenting um, on Guide Collective. So Linda, hello to you. George, hello to you as well. Shinta is saying hi to us from San Francisco. Uh, Andrea, I don't know where you are right now, Andrea, if you are in Arizona or if you're near a plane or if you are somewhere in California, but hello to you. Kathy, hi from Utah. Fran, 
hello, friend Jacobs. Um, Nick, thanks for giving us a little feedback about the video earlier, appreciate that. Um, Melissa Phelps is saying hello to us, as she's saying buongiorno from California. And uh, Diane, Diane from Rocks Beach, Florida. Hi there, how's hello. everything going down in Florida? And um, I put out a, a question out there. If you guys have any questions that you have for Brian or Roberto, go ahead and type them in the comments. And hopefully at the end of this, we'll have some time to, to go through some of those. But let's keep going. Let's go to a new place. Let's go to Montalcino. And that is about 45 minutes southeast of Siena. And you guys share another person who is quite passionate about what he does another vineyard, but showing us a different, um, a different expression of his love and his passion and, and wanting to connect with other people on a one-on-one -on -one basis through his art. So let's watch this clip. Grande passione. E anche del lavoro, lavoro fisico, lavoro che ti sporca le mani e quindi l'ho rappresentato con il nero. Una piccola parte di nero. Finalmente occorre, oltre la terra, la passione e il lavoro, la luce del sole, un, una bella annata luminosa e piena di, di calore e questa gliel'ho data con un, un tocco di bianco. Tutte le etichette hanno oh, questi quattro colori, due elementi sono della natura, la terra e la luce, e due elementi sono umani, il lavoro e la passione. Roberto, how did you find this guy, first of all? Because obviously you're the one who introduced him to Brian, and how do you find these people who are so passionate about their life and their work and, and sharing that with others? Well, the, the, if um, Mother Nature gave me anything as a gift, is curiosity. And uh, beside digging on tombs of finding Etruscans, uh, you know, findings, uh, I dig into the, the people. I, I'm very interested in, in the life of the people all the time. And so uh, it's a search I've done all my life. In this case, in this particular case, I did not take uh, Brian there to taste the wine. We didn't even taste the wine. At the end, he gave a, a bottle as a gift to, to Brian. This Annibale is a Renaissance man. It's a man of art. He loves art and art is love. And so everything he touches is beauty. From his, the label of that you saw just painted to a ceramic, to metal working, to woodworking. He, he has there a laboratory that you wouldn't believe what he does there. And so he lives uh, uh, in constant touch with art. And, and so uh, uh, besides sharing him, uh, um, important that at the end, he says something that in a way uh, uh, remain in our memory forever. He says, whatever you do, you have to make your hands dirty. And this is true. We are in, in, in a world where everybody is uh, buying and selling something, making money just buying and selling without ever touching anything with your hands. You see what I'm saying? And he is still in touch with the nature, he's still in touch with his uh, forest, with his place, with his art. So he uh, was a perfect interpreter uh, of what I consider a Renaissance man. And Brian, what was your takeaway um, from, from meeting him and exploring his incredible place? Because right now we're looking at, you know, we saw him not only hand decorating every single wine label there and sharing his philosophy about it, about what he designed. But then like Roberto said, his whole place is a laboratory for his art. And you can see just from these pictures, these amazing things that he's created what, what, what did you take away from this experience and what, do you, what, do you, what did you learn from him? Roberto said we were going to meet a famous Brunello winemaker. So where does my head go to? Oh, we're gonna go taste Brunello. I mean, that's what I thought I was going to do. And we did not taste any wine, but Timey showed me these little hand carved pipes that he made and he had taken all these, the bark from trees and made a book 
library and you open up each book and it, inside there is samples of what you can make from the barks of these trees. And I said, I said wow, I'm meeting an, an artist. Even, which is not in the, not in the film, but he, he had me taste uh, a grape and told me how to taste it. And there was like three or four different aspects of what you're supposed to feel, but it was all about getting your hands dirty. It's not just, let's taste some wine. It's not a, a cocktail. Um, so the impression that I was left with is that you have to really dig deeper into things and look at things with different eyes. And he was a really complete ex example of what Roberto said before I arrived, don't have any expectations. Just experience these people, get to know these people and you will be richer for it. And that's exactly how I felt when I left. It was just, I would go home and, and sit on the bed and view through the little finder what I just shot and I, and I was just mesmerized. I was uh, overwhelmed, I guess I should say, every night. And I and then, then came the thought, how am I gonna make this into something that people will relate to? <laughs> well, and you, I think you know, that we, we do yeah. relate to it because yeah. I think in a lot of ways we have a longing for that. We might not be able to put a finger on it, but in these days where everything comes to us so easily, I can tap something on my phone and boom, I have that information. I can stick something in the microwave, boom, it's done. Everything is so right. at the ready that we don't, right. we don't necessarily think about where does this come from? How is this made? What if I made it? What if I put that much energy and that much passion into something and to see other people just even on your own street, but let alone when you're traveling, <laughs> who commit to that, right? Like this isn't, this might be, a ho I don't know, this might be a hobby or a, a, you know, just an extra thing that he does because he has energy and passion, but there is commitment to this. I mean, nobody just does this on, on a whim, but to, to, to be around somebody who shares that and lovingly shares that and wants to expose people to that, I, I think that that can't help but leave a marker on your heart and on on your mind as a traveler, and right, that's and that really and that's why and that's why he appears after Romano in the fabric shop says that my my obsession was to fixing the time that words are flying but nothing is written remains. So here is a guy that is looking at history, looking at what uses the bark from trees can have in our life. And he wants people to know the color of the ink, what, whatever was in, in those boxes, which we uh, show in the film. Um, it was mind boggling. I just, again, I kept saying, Roberto, you did it again. I left there scratching my head going, <laughs> what, what did I just witness? <laughs> I'm holding a bottle in my hand. I didn't even get to taste the wine. And we'll probably be open, opening that bottle of wine for Thanksgiving. And you have memories and experiences richer that, than you could have ever imagined. So what a beautiful souvenir, even if you didn't mm -hmm. taste the wine yet. Yeah, exactly. um, I want to take us now that we've mentioned Romano again, I want to take us to our final clip that we have. And again, so we'll watch this clip and then we'll have a, a wrap up discussion with Brian and Roberto. Your presence is giving me hope, it's giving me <laughs> taking out of my shoulders a few centuries and uh, so it's a joy to have relationship with you. It was a joy to have a relationship with him. And thank you for sharing him with all of us. Thank you, Roberto. Thank you, Brian. Thank you for so lovingly crafting this documentary together to share what you've learned um, about leaving expectations behind and, and letting life and people and culture reveal themselves to you and being in that moment. Uh, do you guys have any 
other final things that you want to say about the documentary or, or anything about your relationship, your, your relationship now to these people and, and now being able to reflect back on it and anything else that you can say in summary? Um, I just want to say that um, uh, we maintain the promise to Romano who left us yesterday that we, we did fix the time with this documentary. We did fix the time for him. And uh, I hope that everybody that will watch it will get a little piece of this beautiful cake that we made. So thank you for hosting us. Yes, thank you. So thank you so much, Trish, because I think giving a deeper look at this, people who have already seen the film may go back and look at it with different eyes again. People who haven't seen the film, Tuscany Beyond Expectations. Um, I hope you'll take a look at it. It's free for Amazon Prime members. So just type in the name or type in Roberto's name or my name and you'll find it. And uh, Again, just thank you for letting us share this beautiful gift that uh, Roberto gave me uh, through Facebook. I mean, it's amazing. Just amazing that the world can connect so easily in that way. And now I know you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, I, and I feel so grateful. Thank you, Roberto, for yeah. connecting me to yeah. Brian and for reconnecting me to the Tuscany that I love and the Tuscany that I still long to experience. Um, is, do you guys want to, uh, um, I, I don't know how comfortable you feel with this, but if anybody wants to reach out to you, because I, I highly encourage everybody to watch this. Again, as Brian said, it is free to those of you who have Amazon Prime, and then if you don't have Prime, you still can rent it on there. Um, right. So it's, it's quite easily accessible. But if people have further questions or they want to share their experiences with you, is there a place where they can reach out to you guys? I'm, I'm on Facebook as The Showbiz Chef. The, and, and you can learn I, amazing recipes from him yeah. and see all the uh, really cool stuff that he makes. So at The Showbiz Chef. Right. Showbiz. And I'm just a Robert, Facebook Roberto Becchi. And Roberto my first and last name. And, and Tours by Roberto is the company. And, uh, you know, I have also a farm. But uh, the, the best way to, to connect with me is by Facebook with uh, Roberto, we can accept every friendship. I also have I also have a YouTube channel that's just under my name, Brian Gendisi. So that's that's well. Take advantage of that, you guys, of being able to reach out to the producers yes. of the documentary film Tuscany Beyond Expectations. Huge thanks to the both of you, to you, Brian, to you, Roberto. Thank you to everybody who tuned in this morning to watch, or if you're watching this as a, as a recorded event, um, thank you for watching this. I'm Trish of The Travel File and also of Guide Collective. Thanks for joining us and have a great day. Buona giornata. Ciao. Ciao. There's a voice Ciao. that's softly whispering inside my head Telling me I'm gonna be alright He keeps saying let yourself be led where you are led don't hold back, don't put up a fight It tells me to rest the wind Breathe the air There's a place you're meant to be And you're already there Open up your heart And let life be You know that you can always trust the wind Search my soul to find a reason why In the dark of night I feel somebody take my hand And tell me you don't even have to try For you can trust the wind Breathe the air And know that there are helping hands Around you everywhere you